Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hi, I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shoot. Hey, and today we're going to talk about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, author unknown. I've had a copy of it when I was in high school, I think, because I just bought everything that had Tolkien on it. Hmm. I'm not sure I got to the end. So this might be the first time I got to the end. It was the first time I had gotten to the end of the thing, which doesn't mean it was hard to get through. It just means I've been distracted. Well, it's a little hard to get into because it is a poem. So let's set it up for you. Uh, and as always, we are not going to worry that neither of us are experts in Middle English poetry. Nope. But we're going to talk about it anyway. And I think you should too, dear listener, not be afraid to engage in works of art and productions just because you're not an expert. All this stuff is much too important to leave to experts because it's aimed at you and you should be thinking about it. So it is, it was not a hit. It was lost for a while. It is at the same time as Canterbury Tales. And you've probably heard of Canterbury Tales. You might even have read it. Uh, my daughter just acted in a play based on it. What part did she play? Oh, she, what did she play? She's going to be mad that I can't remember. Please say not the wife of Bath. She was not the wife of Bath. Oh, thank gosh. So that one was a hit, and that one has changed language. You can read that one pretty much already. Most of the words you'll get. Uh, if you looked at the original of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, you probably couldn't read it. And the style of poetry has changed. So modern, well, I don't know. Nobody writes modern poetry except the rappers. Uh, but uh, <laughs> You're, You ain't wrong. Well, I remember reading somewhere that the, the number of people writing poetry is rapidly reaching the number of people reading poetry. Mm. And who really reads poetry anymore? I only read it when you make me. <laughs> Thanks for that, though, by the way. <laughs> So it's a it's a little bit different kind of poetry. The usual English poetry is rhythmic and it rhymes. So rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. That's Shakespeare, and that's uh, in iambic pentameter. So da -dun -da -dun -da -dun -da -dun -da -dun. and then uh, there'll be rhymes at the end lines, and he'll end his scenes with a rhyming couplet. Uh, so people are familiar with that. That's what you think of when you do a poem: roses are red, violets are blue. You look like a monkey and smell like one too. This is the way English poetry has gone since Shakespeare, since Chaucer. Whoever wrote this poem, it ain't that. It's alliterative. The fronts of the words rhyme, not the back. Or maybe not even rhyme. Maybe they just all start with L sounds in a particular line or something like that. Yeah, I, I meant by rhyme that they have the similar sound yeah. at the beginning. So it, it's a different kind of a poetry. It was not a hit. This is from a different region of England. Yeah. Chaucer is a, a London Southlands kind of guy. And whoever wrote Gawain and the Green Knight is in the Midlands or even north of that. And it's in a little bit of a different dialect and uh, kind of didn't win the language war. Right. Or, yeah. The, the English we speak is probably more, I mean... Uh, it's related to both, right? But it's more related to the English of Chaucer than the English of our unknown author here. Um, yeah. So that, that uh, probably hurt its popularity. Yeah, and I was thinking as I was reading through this last few days, it was my Christmas reading. When you take one of these lost bits of literature that really hasn't been part of the conversation, why is there interest? Why would you want to read it? <sighs> Are you asking me that? I'm asking you, and I'm asking me. Okay. It's an older form. It's old. I like old stuff. Mm -hmm. This is an, one of the earliest and most popular of the Arthurian legends. So even though maybe this one was lost and wasn't part of the great conversation, I think that the whole Arthur mythology is part of our English conversation. So this is a big piece of that, I think. I'm very interested in our language being English. And this is a big part of that. I did not read the Tolkien uh, translation, Carl. I thought I had that when I didn't, didn't read that. There were two or three words on every page. And this is a translation. This isn't the Middle English. 
there were two or three p- words on every page that I didn't know. So um, I think this gives me a better understanding of English, a better understanding of English history. Um, and doggone it, it's fun. And it's only 24 pages long. <laughs> what do you got to lose? You don't have anything to lose. I was thinking about it. It's a form of poetry, a form of speaking that works in the language. It's an alternate way. Hmm. It still works. It still has power. When you give your speech in front of your your people at your business, you could use alliterative verse, and they wouldn't know it, and they'd be moved by it, and you'd be sneaking it in because they wouldn't recognize it. If you read Lord of the Rings, Theoden talks this way. When he gives his big speeches, like before they do the great charge down the hill, it is this kind of speech. Mm-hmm. I think I told you last week, Neil Stevenson had uh, wrote a time travel book and some either Vikings or Anglo-Saxons managed to steal the time travel device and they make it to modern times. And of course, they're amazed by the, the wealth of the world and they find a Walmart. Yuck. And the wealthy Walmart, they, with weapons wielded, uh, they go in and they, and they, they sack the Walmart and he describes it in this kind of poetry and it works and it's delightful. I, I loved it. I, I, I listened to the audible book and I think I went back and listened to it a few times, just that section. So it's a pattern of language that still works, even if it lost the lottery. Yeah. So it's cool for that reason. Is it going to go make it into the canon, Carl? Oh, I don't know. Such decisions are beyond me. I'm not sure it's of that magnitude. I don't think so. But it's pretty fun. It's fun. It's 24 pages, and I don't. I don't think it makes it into the canon. But we need to keep this one around, right? Huh. We need to keep this one around. I don't know. Mine was mine was about a hundred. Mine was about 90 pages. You must have had a really small type. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, I have the the Tolkien translation in a green covered book because it's the Green Knight. Uh, it's also cool because it gives you some insight into what people in the 14th century wanted to hear, what their poetic imagination was, what their ideals were. A guy at the gym came in and was watching. He told me that he had been watching Charlie's Angels. <laughs> and the the original one right. with uh, Farrah Fawcett. And, and how? Well, that would give you a glimpse of what the late 70s were like. What did people value? Maybe they didn't live like that, but this is what they wanted life to be like. Yep. So uh, you can you can get that from Gawain and the Green Knight. Yeah, it's worth your time. Uh, take a look at it. Should we take a look at it? Yeah. So the mine starts. It gives you kind of an epic beginning. When the siege and the assault had ceased at Troy and the fortress fell in flames to firebrand and ashes, the traitor who the contrivance of treason there fashioned was tried for his treachery, the most true upon the earth. And then it goes on to talk about where the English people came from. But it starts with Troy. Yeah. And by the way, Tolkien holds that alliteration together, right? You hear him. Trains of treason was tried for his treachery, the truest on earth. Ch-ch-ch-ch-ch. Yeah. Who committed the treason in... Troy. Why did they fight the war? I thought he was talking about Paris. No, Aeneas does, right? What treason does Aeneas do? I thought it was Paris. Antenor and and Aeneas handed over the city, right? They opened the gates. I'm not sure that Aeneas did it. I thought thought it made sense with the rest of the story if this is Paris. Well, who who is it that opens the gate and lets the horse in? Is it Antenor? Oh, shoot. From the Aeneid, it's... Well, Aeneas is there and doesn't notice. Leo Cohen, the, the priest says, please don't do this. this. is from the Aeneid. The priest says, don't do this. And then the snakes come and kill him and his kids. Uh, yeah, but that wasn't, the way Virgil tells it, it wasn't treason. It was just a mistake. Hey, look at this great big horse. But let's, so I think, I'm going to argue that it's Paris that he's talking about here. Because what did Paris do when he went to the house of Menelaus? And he was a guest in the house of Menelaus. And there was Helen. Mm. And Menelaus left town. And what did Paris do with Helen? Stole her. Yeah. Well, you're going to have a similar thing in the plot here where Gawain goes on his journey and he meets a woman. And he's living in a guy's house and he meets a woman and he's similarly tested. And you could see whether Gawain makes it out. 
it's an interesting test. He doesn't do very many tests of arms in this story. So it's interesting. It's like, like a, I used to read Tales of King Arthur when I was a kid. I think oh, yeah. it was Howard Pyle. I had that edition. Yeah. The hero would go on a journey and would have to do battle or solve a puzzle or find a MacGuffin somewhere. And Gawain, well, well, we'll talk about the story in a little bit, but his, he mostly doesn't do feats of strength in this story. He's just tried over and over and over. Yeah. So should we lay out the story? Who is the Green Knight? It's King Arthur's court. It's Christmas time. Well, before that, though, Carl, Oh, our author, whoever our, our author is, uh, makes a claim that England is a direct descendant of Troy. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. I hope that's true. <laughs> Well, Joseph of Arimathea is supposed to have gone there. Hmm. So it also has links there. That's why the Holy Grail got there. I hope all that's true. I like that a lot. <laughs> so they're having a party. It's Christmas Tide, which for them would be from December 25th to January 7th, because they do it the old way. And they're all there in the hall at Camelot around the table, the round table, supping and sharing mirth with each other and making merriment and courteous conversation, and some guy, a green knight, a giant person, atop a horse, <laughs> rides his horse right into the dining hall uh -huh. and says, I hear you all say you're badasses. I think not. And who's in charge here? And everybody's quiet. And then finally Arthur says, uh, that'll be me. He says, well, I'd like to play a game. I'm not here to cause you any harm, but I would like to play a game. I'll let you hit me one time here, and then a year and a day from now, I'll return the blow. And Arthur says, well, game on. You can't come here to my house and treat me in such a way, so I'll do that. Gawain, his nephew, says, no, the king, uh, please let me do that. Because he's big, and he's scary, and he's all green. His hair is green, his skin is green, his horse is green, his armor is green. And he's a scary dude, and uh, he allows, Arthur says, okay, Gawain, you do it. So the guy takes a knee, the green knight takes a knee, bows his head. Gawain takes the Danish axe that the, which I thought was interesting, that the knight brought with him and lops his head off. And the knight picks his head, stands up, blood shooting out of his neck hole, <laughs> and picks up his head, <laughs> points the head at Gawain and Arthur and says, uh, well met. Catch you guys at the Green Chapel in a year. Don't be late. And leaves. Yeah, it's a wonderful beginning to this story. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, it would make a good movie, except they wouldn't be able to do the middle. They wouldn't get the middle right. I like the reaction. So, well, I want to back up a little bit. So the reason that Arthur gets mad and says, I'll do it, is the Green Knight taunts them. He shows up and nobody's there. No, nobody wants to do the thing. And this is in paragraph 14. He says, what is this Arthur's house? The rumor of which runs through realms unnumbered. Where now is your haughtiness and your high conquest, your fiercely fell mood, your fine boasting? So he laughs at them. None of you will play the game. And that's when Arthur gets up and does it. But then Gawain says, let me. After he walks out carrying his head, this is the end of my paragraph 20. The king and Sir Gawain at the green man laugh and smile. Yet to men had appeared, twas plain, a marvel beyond denial. So each uh, each poetic unit has a rhyming thing at the end. <laughs> but they are laughing. I wrote there, I wouldn't have laughed. <laughs> You're sitting at your mead hall somewhere in Oklahoma, and you're feasting from Christmas till Epiphany, and somebody walks in and says, you get one shot. You know, and so you take your shot, and there he is. You think he's dead, but he walks up. He gets up. It says, see you in a year and a day. You wouldn't say, well, there's a sight. <laughs> well, I, I wrote here, I wrote here, Carl, that we had all fell on him and whipped his ass. That way, there wouldn't have been like, oh, okay, you, you've, you've, you've come here and broke up our party, and one of us is going to play the game that you brought to our house, this absurd thing. Of course, you know, this is this weird chivalric ideal that they're playing out here, but it's completely foreign to me. Like if somebody came to my house, we had a Christmas party, you know, somebody mm -hmm. and then comes in and says, you know, 
we're going to trade licks here. And I'd be like, no, you're not. You're going to leave right now. <laughs> and if you didn't leave, we'd have fell on him and whipped him. But, but is this the Scott Hamburg whose deeds we have heard from afar? It's fixing to be. Well, so that there's something different then yes. in this idea of chivalry. Yep. Uh, and I had some notes here on it myself. So it is a little foreign. But these are the things, just like uh, my friend at the gym likes uh, Charlie's Angels because it's full of awesome 70s stuff. These guys are different. So they are not just feasting for Christmas. I got it in uh, stanza three. Uh, there tourneyed many a time the trusty knights and jousted full joyously these gentle lords. So what do they do for fun? They're Fight. fighting. In five, Arthur always wants to hear about a new marvel before he eats. So what does he want to hear about? Of noble men, knighthood, new adventures, or a challenger should come a champion seeking to join with him in jousting in jeopardy to set his life against life. Yeah. That's what they enjoy doing. <laughs> so foreign to me. In that stanza five, I thought there was a really human portrayal. I'm reading the W.A. Nielsen translation. Really hum human portrayal of Arthur. He said, um, Arthur would not eat till all were served. He was so merry in his mirth and somewhat childlike in his manner. His life pleased him well. He loved little either to lie long or to sit long. So busied him his young blood and his wild brain. So he was just like beside himself. Like he couldn't sit still and his brain was just running away with him. He was mm -hmm. just excited that evening. And another custom moved him also that he, through chivalry, had taken up. He would never eat upon such a dear day before he was told an uncouth tale some adventurous thing or some great marvel that he could believe of ancient heroes of arms or other adventures. Really childlike sort of depiction of him. I, I kind of like it. Yeah. This isn't yet the grim Arthur of the end of uh, Once and Future King. Meanwhile, Gawain is placed there beside Guinevere in Agravain of the Hard Hand. And so I wrote next to that, Carl of the Hard Pleasure. <laughs> That's you now. You haven't dug into the appendixes of Tolkien yet, have you? Not, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, in the Lord of the Rings, yeah. Because Tolkien gets a whole bunch of, of his ideas from this sort of stuff. This was his job, was to teach this stuff. And the hero named Helm, mm. from which Helm's Deep was named, they're stuck in there in a siege, and he would just go out in the middle of the night in secret and punch people to death. <laughs> Go out in the enemy camp and then punch them. And in the end, he's so tough, he keeps going out and he's old. And he goes out and uh, he doesn't fall down dead. He just, he's standing there, frozen. But that's just what that reminds me. Agravain of the hard hand. The knockout it's, it's, game. Yeah. Just imagine, you're, you're besieging a castle and every night, some guy's coming out and punching one of you to death. <laughs> It's terrible. <laughs> but this is the sort of thing that he's touching into. So you say it's foreign to you. I bet it's not quite that foreign. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. Th these deeds of glory, the thing I heard that somebody did, you know, I can't believe this guy did that. Or things you'd like to be able to have done. You know, I think maybe the firearm or something has uh, kind of rolled some of this back. Like if you go to some bar and uh, start some business, like you might get shot. Yeah. No chivalry in that. But, you know, it used to be, it used to be you could go to some beer joint and have a dust up and maybe chip a tooth or whatever and uh, live on to tell about it. And it ended up being a good story someday, but mm -hmm. man, not no more. Yeah. Well, nowadays we play, what do we do? We play uh, video games Yeah. for our adventures. Uh, but here they didn't do it. They had, they actually had to do them. I went to, uh, I don't know why I thought of this, but I'll tell the story anyway. I had a friend of mine with me 25 years ago. We were in Chickasha, Oklahoma, and they had a pool hall on Main Street like every small town used to have. And we went in the pool hall and, um, got, you know, you play by the hour, you get your billiard balls and you take it to a table, you know. And we went over to this table and uh, two of these cowboys in there walked over and said, hey, uh, this table over here is way better than that table. We, we think you ought to play over here. <laughs> and my friend said, well, that's, aw that's awfully nice of them. I sure appreciate that. And I said, his, my friend Justin, I said, Justin, these motherfuckers are going to kill us. We need to get out of here right now. And we played one game of eight ball, and we 
GTFO H'd. <laughs> it was a scary deal, but he was completely oblivious to the tension and the violence that was hanging in the air in there. So he would have gone through the, the wilderness on his horse and the uh, glamorous lady would stand beside the her bower and invite him in and he, his radar wouldn't go up. He'd say, okay. Oh, I bet she's got sweet tea and Col Toll House cookies in there. That'll be good. <laughs> it's Morgan Le Fay or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, just go in there and get eaten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's something in there. We talked about this with regard to weightlifting. Uh, to see it as the doing of great deeds so that you can tell the tale, you know, to get some glory out of it. I bet it's in there somewhere. Yeah. Chivalry is not just made up garbage. It, it's appealing to something about humans, or at least about men. Because these are not, look, this is 14th century England. People listening to it, would they have been knights in armor jousting? No. Not too much of the stuff that's in the story would probably be happening, but it's appealing to them. The people are listening to it. Yeah, not many people in the 70s got to hang out with Farrah Fawcett either, but no, so be it. Oh, those shows are so great. They'd just be this easily solvable mystery, mm. cool cars and good music. Opportunities for ladies to run <laughs> in t-shirts. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I wonder why he's green. Why is the Green Knight green? And his horse, too, I think. Aren't dragons green? Uh, some of them are. I don't know. I don't know either. I was thinking about that. And the magic belt or the supposed magic belt that's going to show up later is also green. And I'm wondering if this was my little thought. So Gawain is going to get himself stuck into a little bit of the fairy world. Mm. This is a story. It is a Christian story stuck on top of some. Well, Morgan Le Fay is going to show up later. Morgan the fairy, mm. you know, and. I was thinking maybe the green might be all the nature spirit stuff. Some of that weird druidical hangover things that the English had. Yeah, well, there you are trying to carve out a, just a thought for me. You're trying to carve out your little bit of a homestead or a house and the greenery, at least in my area of the world, just wants to take it all away and cover it over and grow mm -hmm. and fill all the cracks and... Nature's not always your friend. You know, sometimes it's trying to take you back. Mm -hmm. It's just a thought. I'm not sure why he's green, but it's weird. He's completely green. And Gawain's horse is green galay. Mm -hmm. It's not spelled the same way, but interesting. Well, I like that they laugh when he shows up. After they've knocked his head off, they laugh. I think that's... What else are you going to do? Is it nervous laughter or are they truly amused? Well, I don't know. They laugh and smile. And Gawain's going to go. He's going to do it. So now you have a year and a day, and you have to go and, without flinching, take a blow. And you just chop the guy's head off. So what kind of blow do you think you're going to get? Yeah, and he's twice as big. Yeah. Twice as big. He's an enormous person. So a year goes by, and then Gawain suits up. Um, he suits up in armor. They describe the armor I like the year, too. Mm. They describe the, the seasons and how they go. I thought that was a nice bit of, of history. The spring with the Lent, the crabbed Lenten, the crab. uh, yeah. that f with fish tries the flesh and with food more meager. Uh, and then summer comes and there's summer breezes. And then uh, you have the joys of the harvest. It was a nice little description of what the seasons would be to these people because uh, your whole life is ordered around them. I thought that was neat. But tell me about the armor. Well... They describe there in a uh, fit two. <laughs> he talks about the brave man uh, stepped thereupon. He uh, he steps up on this most beautiful carpet from Toulouse, by the way. What do you call your uh, your helpers if you're a knight? I don't know. A squire. Yeah. This they, they dress him. They dress him. Um, they describe his greaves, just every single piece and how they tie it on, uh, tie it onto his body. His gloves of plate. And all this goodly gear that is gilded in gold. Mm -hmm. Gold spurs, well fastened, and uh, a sure brand girt. About, and a lot of G's in there. Um, they just describe all of it, his helmet and everything. I, I love it. And, of course, the horse. The horse has armor as well. And describe his saddle and the ribbons in the horse's mane and gold fringes everywhere. Uh, so you get, you get a description 
of of what their gear would have been like. Yeah. And they use a bunch of French loan words in there. They didn't really have native English words for that high tech stuff. It's so high tech. I and mean, the guy's putting on a stealth fighter. Right. <laughs> like who has yes. this stuff? Who has this stuff? Not very many. Not very many. But he's got it. Yeah. And then he goes to church. And then he goes to church. After he gets all his armor on. They described many fives. Did you see that in uh, paragraph yeah. seven? Many fives. He has five wits, five fingers. They talk about the five wounds of Christ, the five joys of, I think, Mary. And then Gawain has five virtues. Mm-hmm. And then on his armor is a, a five-pointed star. Yeah. That represents all of these things. And this kind of this comes back later. I want to talk about the five virtues. Yeah. And, and see what your translation calls them. So free giving, friendliness, chastity, chivalry, and piety. Those were the five that I had. And I think he does pretty well on three of them. I think there's two of them that he screws up. Generosity, fellowship, purity, courtesy, and pity. Pity? Piety is what mine says. Um it has Maybe to it's be pity. piety. It has to be piety. Come on. Well, we're going to go see. So uh, when you read it, you try to figure out where he screws up. Because Gawain is not perfect. He has a flaw. But it's a nice story, and we'll see at the end. He's going to be tested now. So he's going to go on his journey. He's got his... I think the virtues are there. I think they're important. You have to see how he's going to be tested and whether he's going to succeed or fail. Yeah, nowhere among these virtues are listed courage uh well, courage. And you know, when I think of knights I th- in chivalry, I I think of that. And it's just an afterthought. You know, he he's anticipated for a whole year that this big giant dude is going to lay one on him here, and he's mm-hmm. just got to anticipate it every single day. I mean, it would make me miserable. Can you imagine? And and he's dealt with that the whole time and then he go he seeks he sets out for the green chapel, he knows not where. And it says, sometimes he warred with serpents and with wolves also, sometimes with savages that dwelt in the cliffs, both with bulls and bears and boars sometimes, and giants that assailed him from the high fell. I mean, he, he's just, I mean, he's just scrapping everywhere he goes. And then that's just a, an afterthought in the story, or just a, that's a D plot. They don't even go into it. Uh, he's sleeping on the ground in his armor on naked rocks were clattering from the, crest the cold burn ran i had to look up burn it's, you know cold water isn't that interesting mm-hmm. like water mm-hmm. that's cold they would call it burn which is i mean if you put your hand in the ice water it burns yeah and then on uh, christmas eve he takes a knee and prays that he might find a place where he could hear mass <laughs> and then he then pretty much looks up and there's a castle the fairest he's ever seen yeah, I want to uh, make a slight note against Cromwell, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I, this might be weeds that we don't want to get into, but the, the people for whom the people for whom Gawain the Green Knight is written are pretty darn Catholic in the 14th century. Uh, he's saying uh, prayers to Mary all the time. He's always looking to go to Mass. The, it's just assumed. In no place is this weird in this story. This is just what knights did. You got dressed in your armor and you went to church. Uh, and there's Mary and devotion. And it, it's stuff that would typically be seen as Catholic today. But that's what Mary Old England was. Yeah. Uh, it took some doing to make it not that. Which, you know, Henry VIII and Elizabeth and Cromwell. By uh, doing, you mean killing. Yeah. So he quiets up to this castle. And it's locked up tighter than a drum. Uh, portcullis is down. I think there's a drawbridge. It's up. He can't get in. High, high towers, hard hewn stone, corbelled under the battlements in the best manner. Just chalk white chimneys. There's that alliteration stuff. Um, painted pinnacles. A lot of alliteration. And, uh, I see this very much as a Monty Python scene where he shouts and some some guy with a cleft <laughs> palate at the top of a, one of these corbelled uh, towers uh, yells at him, uh, a porter that yells back at him that, that he is welcome to dwell while he likes. And they open the gates and uh, he swiftly 
rides uh, Green Galay into the into the castle and is greeted as a traveler. You know, they got this hospitality in here that's just astounding. I mean, they just, you know, here, man, pick out the best robes. Here's the best bed. Here's the best food. It reminded me of the hospitality we read about in a, in the, the Odyssey over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering why they knew he was special. They don't know anything about him. Because he's wearing that stealth fighter crazy armor and gold and ribbons and like everybody else is wearing like weird home spun stuff and rags tied around their feet and you know i mean 1289 england or whatever this was supposed to be in homer there's two words for man there's anthropos uh and on air and uh anthropos just means man in general it's like what the guys in the field might be and then on air is it's the root of the name andrew mm. It's the heroes. So there's a different kind of man, and you would recognize that sort if it came to you. Gawain is, well, he's big and tough and tough enough to wear all this armor, plus he's got all the armor. He's clearly a person of note once you see him. The courteous one. And yeah. when you speak to him, you know you, they know even more so. Yeah, I like, they wanted to learn from him his manner. So it's in the next next paragraph or so. So when he shows up, the people who live in the castle, that he's an opportunity for them to learn something of courteous behavior, which I thought was weird. It, it's like fashion. If uh, mm-hmm. who would be comparable to Gawain? Somebody really fancy showed up at your Christmas party in your on your homestead. Now, fairly shall we mark the fine points of manners and the perfect expressions of polished converse. How speech is well spent will be expounded unasked, since we have found here this fine father of breeding. Um, they want to check him out and see how do the civilized people act. Right. Well, courtesy would be courtesy. We say courtesy, but it would be the manner of court, right? Mm-hmm. Which would be somebody who, you know, if you were a member of court, you were somebody who was in presence of royalty and the king and the ruling family of the country. And to understand and know court to see would be to mean you were part, maybe the, you were privy to some stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not just please and thank you. And yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. It's something more than that at this time. I think. Yeah. I was thinking also, I mean, this is a poem in for the Midlands. You're out there in the rural areas for the, I'm thinking from the standpoint of the listener, Mm -hmm. the person hearing the poem, you might want to, you might have this thought, I, I, how do civilized people act? How do the fancy people act? What are they doing in New York and Paris and London? You know, you're making a face now, and I, I, you've kind of reacted against that, but there's people yeah. that do that. I mean, what's an Instagram influencer? You learn how to act from these people. Was, um, well, we don't know where Camelot was, right? But, are, no. but when they talk about court at that time, were they thinking Winchester? You know, where was the seat of England at that time? In the 14th century? Yeah. It wasn't London. Well, I don't know. Maybe it was. The tower has been there for a long time. Who is king in the 14th century? Oh, my gosh. Here we go. This makes for good podcast as we look up the history of England. Right. Yeah, so I like that they wanted to learn his manners. So this guy welcomes him into the castle. Gawain gazed at the good man and greeted him kindly, and he thought bold and big was the baron of the castle, very large and long in his life at the prime. Bold and bright was his beard, and all beaver-hued, stern, strong in his stance upon stalwart legs. His face fell as fire and frank in his speech. So, um, we don't get the lord of the castle's name. He welcomes him in. Gawain doesn't know his name. Come on in. Share my stuff. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. This is weird. This is like, hey, guys, that pool table over there, that's a good one. Right. Dude, I was spooked. I was like, these big old square-headed guys are going to kill us. we got to get out of here. It's the end of the House of the Plantagenets. It's the beginning of the House of York. It's Edward I, Edward II, Richard of Bordeaux. That would have been, uh, that would have been here. So they have a feast. And there are some ladies in the castle. Yeah. He's met almost right away by two ladies. An older, he says it's an ugly lady. 
I don't think old necessarily means ugly, but he says both, right? Older mm-hmm. and uglier lady. And then one who looks like she might be related to the older lady who is young and quite beautiful. More lovely than Guinevere to Gawain she looked. To Gawain. I thought that was awesome that he had to qualify that. You think Gawain has weird taste? He might. People have their types, you know. We do. So there's two ladies, so there's going to be trouble. Not was bare of that lady, but the black brows, the two eyes, the nose, and the naked lips. And those were ugly to behold and oddly bleared. That's the older <laughs> lady. Her body was short and thick. Her hips round and broad. More pleasant to look on was the being she led. And that was the one that was more lovely to Gawain than Guinevere. No, that's not Guinevere. This, so Guinevere is not at this castle. This no, is but the other one was the one that was oh, more yeah, lovely yeah. to Gawain than Guinevere. Yeah. And so his host says, "Hey, good to see you. Pick out something nice to wear. Get out of that old armor. We'll take care of your horse. A husbandman, take this horse. That groom, take the horse. Put him up. And they feed the guy. And the host says, "Hey, I'm getting ready to go out hunting. Let's play a game." <laughs> Whatever I get today, I'll give you. And then whatever you get today, when I get home, you give that to me and we'll do a little weird ass gift exchange. What do you say? This is so weird. It's so odd. And and then Gawain, he's just a chump to me. He's like, yeah, you know, I already got myself in a mess by trading licks with this giant. I'll play your stupid game. Note that it's another trade. Right. Right. It's another trade. That's a clue. You know, if you're reading this the first time. So uh, you're going to stay here with my wife. I'm going to go out <laughs> hunting and we're going to make this a- arrangement. Whatever you gain, you may get, you will give an exchange. Uh, and so he goes out hunting. I have to note. So this is, I guess you have the big divisions. This is right before three, paragraph before three. Hmm. The uh, lords and ladies of this castle are uh, making merry. And, and my translation says, uh, they laughed one and all, they drank and they dallied and they did as they pleased, these lords and ladies, as long as they wished. And then with customs of France and many, <laughs> and many courtly phrases, they stood in debate soft and soft words bandied and lovingly they kissed their leave taking. Is this the first French kiss in literature? I thought the same thing. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it's like these people in the Midlands in England, and, and the, they're thinking France is his place. It's like Hollywood, you know, <laughs> where who knows what they do in France? They have all that style. And I wonder if it had that connotation of, well, they're, they're real pretty, but a little bit off. <laughs> Draw me like you do your French ladies. <laughs> so they, they do that. They go to bed. <laughs> And the next morning, the lord of the house, we don't know who it is, he gets up, hears mass, you know, every day, every day, all day, ate a sop hastily, and then uh, was away quickly with his bugle to the field, and he and his hunters deer hunt all day long. Yeah. All day long. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, Gawain's laying around in bed. These guys are up and gone, man. And Gawain's laying around in bed. The lord's wife sneaks into his room. Gawain is awake though. He knows. He knows she's there. And uh, she sits on the edge of the bed. He makes the sign of the cross before he gets up. I thought that was interesting. Who's this pretty lady coming into his bedroom? Wouldn't you? I hope so. She says, ye are a careless sleeper when one can enter this. But he was awake. He knew and he didn't say anything. The author calls him Gawain the Blythe. (laughs) Gawain doesn't want to uh, upset this pushy dame. She's his hostess, and he that's my impression. that He doesn't want to really upset her. He doesn't want to reject her. He doesn't want to be ugly, but he's threatened and uh, on full alert. Mm-hmm. Well, she says, To my body will you welcome be of delight to take your fill, for need constraineth me to serve you, and I will. I'm imagining Mae West saying those lines. Mm. You know, whatever you want, Gawain, you can have it. Well, how does he get out of this? This is in good faith, a great privilege, it seems to me, though I be not now he that ye speak of, to reach such reverence as you rehearse here. I'm a man unworthy, I know well. By God, I should be glad, if it seemed good to you, to do what I might, 
in speech or in service to enhance your worship. That's pretty slippery. I'm unworthy. I'm yeah. not worthy. And he doesn't head it he doesn't take it head on either. He doesn't right. he doesn't really acknowledge what she's offered there. She says in my translation, she says, Ye are welcome to my person to do whatever you wish. <laughs> he kinda he kinda ducks under that. But later on he says that he is her servant, though. Yeah, so his his response is uh I'm not worthy and I'll do anything you want, I'll be your servant. It says uh, he fenced her. He fenced with her featly, ever flawless in manner. So this is combat, yeah, with words. He is parrying as she thrusts. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, you couldn't defend her. She's a lady of the castle. This would be like going to a Christmas party at your place of employment, where you're not the boss. <laughs> And the boss's wife has had a few drinks and um, is uh, amorous and fixes upon you in the corner and starts flirting outrageously with you. What do you do? I'm not worthy. You have to dodge. You shouldn't do anything, first of all, but you can't do anything because it puts you in a real bad situation. Gawain is up to the task. So he is doing these deeds. We didn't get to hear about him fighting with the ogres on his way here. This is way scarier. This is the fight. <laughs> this is more dangerous. I think she says this to herself. The author says, mused the lady. So I kind of think this was a, an aside or uh, her internal dialogue. She says, though I were the fairest of women, mused the lady, little love would he show because of the danger that he seeks without reproach. The blow that may slay him must needs be undergone. He, uh, she, She's rationalizing, I think, that, he won't do anything with me because he has this bigger fish to fry with uh, the duel that's coming. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think he's told anybody about that, but she already knows. Uh-oh. How does she know? I don't know. Stay tuned. <laughs> they go back and forth a little bit, and then um, she asks for a kiss, and they um, exchange, I think, what might be a courteous kiss. I don't think it was a... Uh, it wasn't in the French style? No, I don't think so. I don't think it was lewd and lascivious. And he and then the author says, they courteously entrust each other to Christ. <laughs> what does that mean? What I wrote after that was like, worst date ever. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> Which, you know, no, that would be a fine date. But I'm saying, like, the way we think of it is, you know, you go on the date and you're hoping, like, this is what guys are thinking. They're hoping... They they actually want to get the kiss, and he doesn't want it, and then they pray together afterwards. It's such good job, Gowan. You're doing really well, <laughs> but it's contrary to what people would think that they'd want to do. He's killing that lady wood. Uh, <laughs> later, they describe all of the deer that they slew, which were many, and they describe yeah. in great detail how they would field dress these deer. Which I, did, I just love these details, like the details about the armor, the details about butchering the deer, about mm -hmm. butchering this uh, wild boar later on. I just, I love that detail because you get to, it's a little slice of life you get in here. Have you gone hunting? Have you ever done this sort of thing? I have. Yeah, I was thinking how to place all this stuff, all the detail that you get in stories like this. In the past, I have read some Tom Clancy. Lately, I've read a lot more Larry Correa, uh, mm. Monster Hunter stuff. It's good fun, but a large portion of those books is telling you about the firearms that are going to be used to fight the monsters. Mm -hmm. And you perk up a little bit as he's describing, you know, the, the Colt 45 with the pearl handle or whatever, you know, and you get all the details of the hardware. It's cool for me. And in Tom Clancy, you'd get, and this is a Stinger X1 missile or whatever. I can't even remember. Right. I don't know if that's a missile, but you're very interested in the ways that, uh, like in the hunt for the Red October, learning how the submarine works, learning how the sonar battle takes place, all of the technical details are themselves interesting. Yeah. So what I was expecting to see, so uh, around here you kill the deer and you and your buddies like fist fight to see who has to do what we call the a-hole detail. <laughs> like you don't want to cut the bowel. You don't want to contaminate the meat. Right. right. And so he talks about them like cutting this deer up and they would t they tied off the windpipe. He calls it the windpipe. It's really not that. It would have been the esophagus, right? And then you, you have to cut around the deer's rectum. 
and then tie that off or pull the entrails out from there so you don't get any of that stuff on the meat. Mm. And then here in North America, I don't know about whatever deer they got over there. I assume they're the same. They got these scent glands, and you need to get rid of those things because the they make this musky, nasty, oily deer scent that they communicate with each other with, uh, mark territory with. Got to get rid of that too because that can foul the meat too. So I was reading that. I'm like, are they are they doing it the way we do it here in Oklahoma? But I I didn't see that piece. But I like that slice of life stuff. Yeah. Oh, and they took some of the guts and they threw it up in a tree and they called that a green tree, by the way. And they called that the Corby's fee. Huh? Corby. The vulture, right? Corvids are like ravens and crows. So I just assumed it was like, that's for the crow. Why would you have to pay them a fee? You know, my, my grandpa used to, when he planted corn, he'd plant one for the mold, one for him and one for the crow on each hill. Huh. I wonder if they might have done it so that the birds stay away while they're doing the butchery. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I like that. That's interesting. Well, then he goes back to the castle, and it's time for the exchange. He's like, hey, Gawain, uh, look at all this deer meat. You got all this venison here. Uh, here's the fattest, best cut here from the ribs. Here you go. Uh, what do you have for me? <laughs> and he throws, Gawain throws his arms about his fair neck and kisses him <laughs> as courteously as he knew how he says there take you there my merchandise i have won no more though i should have given it up willingly even if we're greater <laughs> he's like and, and then the then the host says hey where'd you get that he's like that wasn't part of the deal bubba all you get's the kiss no stories and then he goes out and hunts again Second verse, same as the first. He heads out with his retinue, his hangers on, his crew, his posse, and uh, they scare up a boar who kills a number of the uh, dogs and is fearsome. The master of the house actually wades off into a creek or river and does battle with the boar and kills him. They clean the boar just like they did the deer and bring him in. Meanwhile, Gawain's laying in bed. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on, hold on. Maybe you can explain this better. Isn't a boar just a pig? Why are they so scary? I don't know. But we've got some wild hogs around here. And there's something, you know, they're all feral hogs. Like, I don't think we have a, I don't know, somebody will correct me on this. I don't think we have like a North American wild hog. They're all feral. Like, so somebody's, uh -huh. somebody's New Hampshire white whatever got out and they get weird they grow tusks they get you know we have the arkansas razorback right they get they get really aggressive when they're feral and they're allowed to breed without the direction of the farmer i don't know man they get super aggressive over there they probably have a native animal that i'm not aware of but yeah. over here they're they're bad news like and they're they'll run around in packs you know they have big problems with feral pigs in texas destroying crops and things like that. But over here, I was always told, you see them, you just get up a tree. Unless you have a sidearm. I've heard that if you spear them, they'll just keep running up the spear. Yeah. And you chop your guts out with the tusk. So if a boar spear would have the... I believe that's what's referenced here. The boar spear would have the crossbars on it. To keep, so you could keep your distance. Yeah, so the boar can't get at you. Gawain needs one of those. <laughs> for the lady? Yeah. We wouldn't call it a lady spear, though. We would call it something different. <laughs> the, to to keep the lady at her distance? Right. Courteously. <laughs> yeah, they're scary. We're, I was always told, you know, if you see one of those around here, you get up a tree. But while they're messing with this hog, Gawain's laying in bed, and she comes in here. Actually, she doesn't knock. She just sneaks in and sits on the edge of the bed and they have this uh, clever repartee. But uh, he refuses to speak of love with her, and uh, she gives him another kiss, and they part yet again. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Lord returns, jests loudly, says, look at this hog I killed. Want some ham? And he says, what do you have for me? And he lays another kiss on him. Another smacker. So weird. They do it again. This time it's a fox hunt. He comes back with a fox pelt. Uh, this time Gawain gives him three 
kisses. He kisses him thrice. Yeah, I want to go back to the second one just for a moment. As we, yeah. He's just uh, given three kisses to the Lord of the Castle. It's so weird. It's, it's, maybe kiss means some kind of embrace, but maybe it just means a kiss. It, it's funnier that way. They've got that sort of European kiss on the cheek thing, you know, hit this side, that side. You know, we've seen it. Oh, yeah. So I got a, I got a, um, in my long and torturous academic career, I got a degree from the University of Balamond in Lebanon. It was a correspondence thing. And uh, I had to go up and get my diploma at the end. An Orthodox priest from Syria is handing him out. Mm. He's kissing everybody. In the Syrian way? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, it's the, the, like, you go back and forth three times. I don't know how to do it. I'm worried I'm going to go the wrong direction. My heart rate was up. I didn't want to do it wrong. I didn't want to be rude. Well, if he goes left and you go right, you guys are going to meet in the middle, and it's right on the mouth. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I was doing a lot of thinking, trying to, to suss out that situation. I think I managed it. Yeah, so maybe that's what they mean, but I, I, I think it's funnier if it's an actual, like, modern-day kiss. Yeah. I think that's funny. But in the second temptation, she tells him, wherever favor is found, defer not to claim them. That becomes all the care for courteous manners. You may not be refused. You are stout enough to constrain one by strength, if you like, if any were so ill-bred as to answer you nay. In other words, she's like, you can have whatever's being offered. And even if I didn't say yes, you could take it. She's offering him to take her by force. Which is interesting. And he says, uh, you graciously speak, but force finds no favor among the folk where I dwell. So he's not going to do it. They don't do force in Camelot. <laughs> Maybe you do that up here right. or wherever this place is, but not in Camelot. It, you could tie me up, you know, if you wanted to. And he's like, nope, we don't do that. The author says, great was the peril between them. Ooh. Yes. She's trying real hard. She's trying different techniques to break him. Well, they talk about love here. She says, ye deserve blame if ye love not her who is so near you. Of all creatures in the world, most wounded in heart, unless indeed ye have a sweetheart, a dearer being that pleases you better, and ye have plighted faith so firmly to that gentle one that ye care not to loosen it. Verily now, that is what I believe, and I pray you that you tell me truly, for all the loves in the world deny not the truth with guile. So she's like, look, I'm here, and you best have a girlfriend, or I'm going to be mm -hmm. mad. So, like, what is love here? Is it opportunity? Is it proximity? Is it ooh, chemical? Like, what is it here? Well, why does he say no? No, what, what does she think it is? She says, if you love not her who is so near you, is she saying, I'm here and I'm offering, and you don't, is love in the 1300s here, like the romantic love that we think of? Or is it a more base verb than than we think of? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She's not asking her, him to pledge his heart in his undying fidelity. That's not what she's asking for. Mm -mm. Like I, I, I would like to know more about what the differences in supposed love, I'm making the air quotes, were then versus what we think of post-Byron. <laughs> it's, his, it's his fault. <laughs> She's trying to tempt him physically. I think that's it. I mean, the description of her appearance of her in my paragraph 69, she's very dressed up. Her noble face and her neck all naked were laid, her breast mm. bare in front and at the back also. Uh, I mean, she's in his bedroom. With a low-cut gown, and it's plunging in the back as well. Yeah. Piping hot. Yeah, I think this is physical. I, I don't know. What do the lords and ladies do when they're not out hunting? Um, they sup and make merriment. <laughs> in the French way. In the French way. Yeah, so she comes in there and she's like got her best stuff on. She's looking good. And she says, why don't you want me? You better have a girlfriend. She, he says, by St. John, I have none and none will I have. She says, that is the worst of all. Kiss me now, comely, and I shall go hence. I can only mourn in the world as a maid that loved much. And... Uh, little kiss there, and she says, okay, listen, take this ring. Take this ring. Take it from mm -hmm. me. He says, no, 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 I, I, I don't need that. I, it's too rich. Wouldn't be right. She says, and so she takes off what they call a girdle. I think it's just a sash. I think it's a fabric belt. They call it a girdle in here. Mm -hmm. She says, here's this green silk sash. 
take this. He wasn't interested. He's like, no, no, no. Well, there's danger here right away, okay? Because if she takes, if he takes a gift from her, he has to give it to the Lord of the Castle. And then the Lord of the Castle knows that the lady's been coming into the bedroom. Right. He has to protect her honor. He doesn't have anything to give back to her, but if he takes anything, he's got to, if he's going to be honest, he has to give it to the Lord of the Castle when he comes back. Yep. He doesn't want to besmirch her honor. He doesn't want to put her in a bad spot. But, but she says, hey, by the way, if you wear this, nobody can hurt you. That's like a plus two armor class on your armor class. <laughs> Nerd. Yeah. And he says, now you're talking my language because I got to go, I got to go bust knuckles with this dude here in a little while. I'll take it. I'm awaiting uh, your translation of Godwin and the Green Knight. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> it needs more alliteration, though. All right. Bust knuckles. I'll have to work on that. <laughs> so he uh, he takes it. Then the uh, Lord of the Manor comes back and says, here's this uh, fox fur from um, our hunt today. Uh, what do you have? And he gives him three kisses, but he withholds the green silk girdle mm -hmm. or sash the girdle of protection we will call it carl <laughs> right and so he does not tell the truth and so if we go back to those virtues i guess this is piety i don't know i'm trying to figure out where you would do lying it's, because he's not telling the truth he's not holding maybe chivalry he's not doing courteously you make a deal we're going to trade blows then you have to trade blows we're going to trade benefits you have to trade benefits so at this point this is where he goes wrong and so if this was an old style fairy tale, I'd be thinking he's in big trouble. Yeah. Is this not an old style fairy tale? Is this a new style fairy tale? It's a newfangled fairy tale because mm. it's got a spoiler, it has a happy ending. Mm. If this was a Greek tragedy, this is the moment where you know Gawain is doomed. This is like Agamemnon sacrificing Iphigenia, and you know eventually he's gonna come back and get spoiler killed by his wife. Right. So this is the moment, but, well, we'll see what happens, but uh, it, it's not a Greek tragedy. In your translation, does Tolkien call the fox Reynard? Yes. I like that. I looked that up. Did you go look that up? Uh, I'd heard it before that foxes are called by that name. Yeah, it's like a proper name. Like, it'd be like Clarabelle the cow. Uh, yeah. Reynard the fox. It came, that, I thought that was interesting. Did you ever hear that song, What Does the Fox Say? Yes. <laughs> what does Reynard say? The poor fox. But before, this is interesting, before mm -hmm. the Lord of the Manor and Gawain exchange gifts, Gawain does confession. Mm -hmm. Yep. Isn't that interesting? It is, except that he's still holding on to this thing. So he has it been a good confession? Yep. He might be in trouble for his immortal soul. This is what they believed in merry old England. His piety is not complete right now right right but, yeah so they uh exchange their gifts and then um just before in the last paragraph just before fit the fourth the author changes to first person did you catch that mm -hmm. then with people and with light he was led to his chamber and blithely brought to bed to be at his rest whether he slept soundly i dare not say for he had much to think on for the morrow, if he would. Let him lie there. He was near what he sought. If he will, if ye will be still a while, I shall tell you how they fared. There are like three sentences there in first person. Yeah. It just kind of broke the fourth wall. I wonder if the poet's there and he's, uh, what's his name? Barry Fitzgerald from The Quiet Man hmm. or something. That I, uh, I'd tell you a tale, but me throat is parched. You know, I wonder if the, the bard would pause there. This is when you pay up. Right. You get to, get to the, <laughs> the money shot here at the end. Yeah. If you, pay off. I mean, we could leave it here or um, in uh, the greatest movie ever made, The Princess Bride. <laughs> That's a big claim. We'll get to that on a future show. <laughs> when uh, the grandfather says, uh, I, I guess this story is too much for you. We'll, you right. become very excited. We'll stop. No. Maybe that's part of good storytelling. You got to have the moment. Well, here, I've set everything up. Are you ready to go? Do you want the conclusion? Beg for it. <laughs> so he has a night night of fitful sleep, uh, wakes up in the morning. He gets all cleaned up, puts his clothes on. And by the way, they brought his armor to him, which had been rusty. He had been sleeping outside. Mm -hmm. And it said that the uh, mail and plate was brightly polished. And the rings of his rich Bernie had been rocked 
from the rust. So I had to look that up, and apparently they would like plunge your chain mail in a barrel of sand over and over and over again to like mm. polish it and get all the rust and stuff off of it. And so that's what that wow. had meant. So somebody had really worked hard to clean up all of his armor and put it back in first class order, brought Gringolet, the huge and strong war horse out and uh, the proud horse in his splendid condition, long for spurring and his coat was in uh, immaculate order and he had been well cared for it as well. Can I give some more trivia? Please. All right, so if you're thinking of Gringolet the horse, do you want to know what he looks like? It's a Clydesdale or something like that. Yeah, big shire horse, big war horse, great big horse. Yeah, that's why they have those big horses. Those huge horses that you see, those were for the knights. So if you want to know what that's like, you imagine, that's one of the things of history I'd like to go see, maybe, is what a genuine cavalry charge of Oof. mounted knights would be. It was the weapon of mass destruction of the Middle Ages. Okay, there was a scene in Game of Thrones that was like this when the Knights of the Vale show up and just crush everybody. Um, in the Crusades, uh, you've got these people from the West showing up in the middle of the desert and not finding water and everything. But still, when they managed to do the cavalry charge, nobody could withstand them. Blitzkrieg. Huge horse, armor, lance pointed straight at you. It's neat. You know, if you've ever played horseshoes, I have. You, you'll notice that the horseshoe that you play with is like novelty size. It's not like the horseshoe you'll see like a quarter horse or Morgan or just some regular old, you know, cutting horse or whatever what you use. They're much, much bigger. People would have played with shoes off of a Shire horse or Clydesdale or some, you know, some big draft animal, some big war horse derived animal way back before Hasbro or Hasbro or whoever the heck makes like, <laughs> you know, uh, horseshoes for horseshoe sets now. Well, that would be comparable to the jousting, right? Right. <laughs> to play horseshoes with a 30 pound ho uh, horseshoe. I mean, these are huge, huge animals with a, you know, f hoof like a skillet, you know, big, big animals. So the master says, hey, man, you're you're not too far away from this, this place you seek. I'll send a guy out with you, and he'll show you right where to go. And uh, they head out. They come to a creek, and the guy says, over there is where you're headed, but I don't think you should go. All kinds of people have gone over there. None of them have, none of them have come back. He's killed this kind of person and that kind of person, everybody. So listen, don't go, and I won't tell a soul you didn't go. I'll keep your secret. That's another test. Gramercy, quoth Gawain. And sternly he added, Well worth thee, man, who wishes my good, and I well believe thou wouldst lo loyally conceal me. But if thou kept promise never so faithfully, and I gave up here, sought for fear to fly as you advise, I were a night coward, I could not be excused. I sought for fear to fly. That's a good line. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, I'm going on. And the other guy says, Mary... As in, Mother Mary, best of luck, Bubba. And he leaves. I don't have the best of luck, Bubba. That's in, that's in there. It's in there. It's in the original. <laughs> but that's alliterative. You see, that's the best way you should do it. Luck, Bubba. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's poetry. This is ancient magic of the English language that you could recover. Yeah. So he, fought, he comes up on this hill. He comes up on a smooth hill, and it's grassy. Uh, it has a little hollow. It's kind of, I, I, I envision like a dark opening in it he comes up to a hobbit hole doesn't he yep well or a barrow yeah like the barrow whites from the beginning there's a whole lot of lord of the rings in here yeah i think so that's what i saw there and he says gosh I, you know i expected i expected to see more but i reckon this is the green chapel again some more elvish stuff right Mm-hmm. the green chapel's a hole in the ground yeah where would elves hold church Probably right there. Yeah. Well, now there's a time for the test. Yeah, and the green knight comes out of there. Green hair, long green hair that hangs down past his shoulders. I envision somebody that looks like uh, the singer from um, maybe Nickelback, but bigger, <laughs> with green hair. And he comes out of that hole, that dark place, with a fell weapon. Tolkien uses fell for terrible over and over and over again in uh, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. We use it here. Fell means terrible here. A Danish axe. And he pole vaults over the creek with the axe and plops down on the opposite side of the creek uh, where Gawain is. Says, hey, 
glad to see you here. Wasn't sure you'd show up, but uh, good on you for doing so. And uh, it's time for your blow. Yep, Gowan's ready to take it. Yep, he takes a knee and bends over, takes his helm off and bends over, and the guy goes into the wind-up, the back swing with the axe, and he says, oh, wait a minute, I forgot. You need to move your collar. Makes Gawain <laughs> mad. He's all keyed up, scared. He moves, he moves, and he takes another knee, and he moves the collar. He does the big wind-up again. He's like, oh, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then Gawain gets super angry. Look, man, I came. I did what I was supposed to do. You're screwing with me. I don't care for it at all. <laughs> Enough of the BS. Do what you're going to do. So he swings at him a third time and nicks him. And then Gawain mm-hmm. immediately jumps up, puts his helmet on, draws his sword. Like, I did what I said I'd do. You got your one shot at me. It's going no further than this. But it's just a nick. It's a punishment. Yeah, the second one, Gawain flinches. Oh, that's what it was. It wasn't the collar. It was the flinch. Yeah, he flinches. He's like, take two for flinching. Yeah, take Should... two for right. the circle game. Yeah. Yeah. The Green Knight. Thou art not Gawain, who is so good reported who never flinched from any foes or fell or in Dale. I didn't flinch when you chopped my head off. Right. <laughs> You shouldn't flinch either. Godwin should have said, yeah, but I didn't screw with you and like wind up like a, one of the three stooges for 12 minutes, you know? Well, all right. Well, now we have to f- figure out what's really going on here because Gawain did not get his head chopped off by this nine foot giant green ogre. Should we just leave it? Should we just sign off and let everybody go read the last bit? Let everybody go read it? Well, we could do that. You could find out why he didn't end up dead. That appeals to me. <laughs> yeah, you should go read it. Um, yeah, but should we go ahead and spoil it? I mean, it's it's a thousand years old almost. I guess we can. Well, it was all a test. Yeah, you know, thrice the lady of the manor came to him, and he rejected her thrice. And the three uh, overtures that cut his head off were about the those three times. And the only reason at the end that he w- wounded him at all was because he had kept the sash and had not told him. Mm-hmm. The Green Knight is, in fact, the Lord of the Manor. And he had sent his wife to test Gawain each night in, or each morning, and Gawain had passed. So some things you get out of this. I like reading it to see how people think of morality and virtue. You know, what is virtue? What's virtue for the people reading this poem? The reason he gets a pass, when you took the belt, but in this you lacked, sir, a little, and have loyally come short, but that was for no artful wickedness, not for wooing either, but because you loved your own life, the less do I blame you. So if he had taken the wife, that would have been for for wooing, that would have been lust, I suppose, or maybe you wanted to despoil the place like Paris did with Menelaus. All you wanted to do was save your life. So that is more acceptable. Do you remember when Thomas Hobbes said that you can't blame anybody? You have an absolute right to defend your life. If they're taking you to the gallows, you have an absolute right to try to get out of it. Yep. Yeah. So this is less blameworthy. It's all right. I'm just going to nick your neck. That's interesting. So there are some vices that are worse than others. To steal a man's wife is very, very bad. To steal his stuff is very, very bad. To take his magic belt to save your life, not so bad. Yeah, you couldn't expect somebody to not do that. You knew you had a big battle coming up. How could you not have kept the girdle of protection? And then at the end, he has the big reveal. He says, I am Burnlack de, House, de Hout Desert. I don't know. I am called in this land through the might of Morgan Le Fay, who dwells in my house. She has acquired deep learning, hard-won skill, many of the masteries of Merlin, for she has at times dealt in rare magic with that renowned clerk, who, which would have been cleric, I'm sure, who knows all your knights at home. So the older lady that had met him at the gate with the uh, lady of the manor was Morgan Le Fay, who was his uncle Arthur's sister. Mm-hmm. Half-sister. And probably not so nice. Yeah, well... You know your Arthurian legends. You know that Arthur was not conceived in a loving marriage. Uther 
went and took what he wanted, which you can go back to that second temptation where the lady of the castle says, you can have me and you could have me by force. Like your daddy did. <laughs> well, like... <laughs> <laughs> or your uncle, Uther. I love those names. Why didn't we name our kids like... Uther. Ethelred and Uther. Yeah. Canute. <laughs> That'd be a nice style to have back. There's some cool names back there. There's some these some of these Anglo-Saxon Britain, British names. Yeah. There's some good ones. Go digging. Find some. I was listening to the History of England podcast. Mm. And, you know, nobody knows if there was actually an Arthur. And so he said there's a couple of bits of evidence that maybe there was. There's a gap in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is all about how cool the Anglo-Saxons are. <laughs> and there's a gap of about 50 years where they don't do anything. And then there is a whole bunch of people showing up slightly after that named Arthur. Mm -hmm. It just becomes a common name. And so who's the guy that does that podcast? I forget David his name. David Crowther, friend of the show. David Crowther does not say, that's Arthur. He just says, well, that's where he would be. <laughs> you know? Because he, wouldn't, he would have been British. He would have been not Anglo-Saxon. He would have been Welsh, you know, off on the Westlands. And if there was a king out there who had beaten the Anglo-Saxons for a while, the Anglo-Saxons wouldn't talk about it. Yeah. You know, it's like you don't go around saying, remember that time I got beat up in high school? Here's all the stuff I wrote about the guy that whipped my ass. <laughs> you don't yeah. do that. You're just not going to talk about it. So there'd be a gap in your personal history. That's when the guy was whipping your ass. These chronicles are really interesting to me. People at some monastery or another typically would keep a chronicle. It shares a root with... Uh, chronometer, chronology, right? It's just a history of what went on. Um, on this feast day, this many people came to the came to the mass. On this feast day, this happened. On this day, the king came through, and we received him with grand honors. And then uh, it was harvest market day, and people brought in this much, these many turnips. I mean, it was a real, real basic stuff. A kind of a diary of the uh, the parish or the church life, which was much the same as village life at the time. And uh, this Anglo-Saxon chronicle started right around Hastings, 1066. And they, they kept this chronicle for another 150 years or something like that. And so there's a spot, there's a, there's a gap in that thing that uh, Crowther and other people speculated that if there was an Arthur, he would have hung out there. There's a set, mm -hmm. there are a bunch of these uh, chronicles there. There's the, Peterborough Chronicle, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there's the Ormulum, the Winchester Chronicle, there's a bunch of them. There's the Russian Primary Chronicle, mm, which tells the mythical story of the origins of the Rus. That one's fun. They might have been Vikings, by the way. They've got a round. <laughs> yeah, and all of that stuff, for me, it's very fertile of imagination. I like this story because it, it's an earlier time, it's something isolated, but it's it's like, you can't know for sure. Yeah. And that's where some of the fun is. That uh, was there an Arthur? Maybe. All of the adventures happen on the frontier. That's where the weird stuff happens. Were these dark ages? Uh, when the story is supposed to have taken place? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Do you think it was a dark time? I don't think I buy the whole dark ages idea anymore. It's a silent age because there's not a lot of writing. Yeah. People are people. Wherever there's people. Yeah, people are living fulfilling lives. They are making a culture. They are making works of art. Uh, when we we don't have evidence, the historian's bias is to say nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Just like that gap in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, that means nothing happened. No, that might mean there was Arthur. You right. just didn't record it. And if we don't see the artwork Let's say your culture, all all of its artwork is carved in wood. And you live in a wet area, you know? Well, 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now, are we going to know any of your stuff? Maybe a couple of pieces left in a peat bog, but the rest is going to be gone. Yeah. And where we have, there have been some hordes that have been uncovered in England uh, there's been some of this of the Mycenaeans in Greece. I think they just got another one just recently. Everybody knows about the Egyptian stuff. So our, our bias is to say, well, Egyptians were cultured and nobody else was. Well, just because we have their stuff because it's in a desert. Right, just because it's arid. Yeah. 
Uh, but Sutton Who, I think, is one that the uh, Crowther talks about. Uh, and you can look these up on the internet and see these people made really cool stuff. So to call it dark, well, no, there were people living their lives and the sun came up on them too. They just didn't necessarily write it down or they didn't live in a city. I think that we have a historiography that is very government and military centric. We, yeah. we typically tend to tell the story of history in terms of big battles and in terms of Greece or in terms of Athens, Sparta, Rome, uh, Prussia, Holy Roman Empire, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And when there's no giant government to point to or no huge military events, the historians traditionally haven't had a lot to say about that period. And I yeah. think maybe it was a very peaceful time. Well, and these stories um, are ways to get back to a little bit of what the people liked. These are popular stories, or they were supposed to have been popular. So looking at the art artwork, this is what the people liked. This is not necessarily what William the Conqueror in his court liked. Mm -hmm. The little details. In in modern history, some of the best stuff for me is the individual people. So I have been to the Missouri Museum of Military History. This is a little museum in Jefferson City. And I follow them on Facebook for whenever I go on Facebook. Uh, we might visit them coming up in a few days. And they posted something. They have a copy of White Christmas, the sheet music. In the old days, you didn't buy records as much. Mm. You would get sheet music and you'd play the song. Well, anyway, and it's just a little story, just a little bit. Th this uh, girl from Missouri and her uncle in uh, 1943, he'd been home on leave and they went to the music store and they bought this sheet music. And then he went back to war and he never came back. And she kept it all that time and then eventually donated it to the museum. This little slice of life of what mm -hmm. somebody in 1943, this girl had a, one of, probably one of the best days of her life, out with her uncle. That, to me, is better than reading about uh, Patton. Right. Patton's important and interesting. They matter. Sure. But for me, I, I want to know what the people are doing. And something like this poem... It's not, not not necessarily what the people are doing because it is, you know, it's a romance, it's fiction, but it's what the people liked. They would have said, <laughs> you can imagine these guys chuckling. He had to go kiss the Lord of the Manor. You know, it's probably as weird to them as it is for us. And, and they, apparently they <laughs> liked reading about or hearing about deer butchery. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's a long chunk. Well, but you know, how many people do you know that would like to hear about that too? I'm raising my hand. Right. And, and at this time, England, I think, the island had like six, seven different kingdoms on it. It's not a big monolith. Uh, history would be difficult to s organize at this time. They've got Anglia, East Anglia, Kent, Sussex, Wessex, Northumbria. You know, the, the, the kingdom or England was not united under a single crown. It's just a confusing time, and historians, I think, have had a hard time creating a, a unifying story about history at that time. And so they just throw their hands up and say Dark Ages. Uh, but I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Well, Dark Ages is, is also a little bit of a political statement, too. Yeah. Because if you call yourself the Enlightenment, then what was before you had to be somehow dark. The endarkenment. Yep. That's a good term. Yes. The endarkenment. That's what we call the postmodern era. <laughs> And by we, I mean me. <laughs> Add it to the Hamburg lexicon. Yes, the endarkenment. Yeah, so it's worth your time. It, it's a, I, I don't think it's one of the books you absolutely have to read, but it's better than HBO. It's worth more of your time than that is. Yeah, it's fun. And uh, we, we've exhaustively <laughs> covered the story. I don't know how much commentary we made on it, but don't think that you've read it. Like, go read it. It's not that terribly long. It's worth doing. Hey, at the end of mine, by the way, Carl, is there's there's a little uh, little Latin here at the tail end of mine. I don't think it's Latin. I couldn't figure it out. Did yours translate it? No, it says H O N Y. I don't know these words. Qui? Qui is who? Mal is like the root for evil, and or I don't know. I don't know what that means. Carl has Latin, and he doesn't know, so it's nonsense. It's okay. probably it's probably 14th century French. Oh, I bet it is. I don't know, 21st century French. 
I aggressively have not learned how to pronounce French, all these names. When I get to them, like Agravain, mm. Dumort, Maine, or whatever his name is, I'm, I'm pronouncing them like Illinois people do. I like that. Green Galette. There's Sir Gowen and the Green Knight. Go read that thing. It's on archive.org all over the place. It's worth reading. It's a short one. It'd be worth reading to your kids, I think. Uh, I think it's that good. Go read that one. And next week, we're going to do some kind of reader mail and uh, questions and stuff like that. But after that, Carl, what should we read? Are we going to read Walden? Are we going to read Amer- the American Declaration of Independence? Well, that's a radical document. That'll cause some trouble. <sighs> had a lot of people that said they enjoyed the propaganda show. Uh, The Lord of the Rings show was very popular, but I think the propaganda show is going to prove to be even more popular. It's timely, but it's also, you know, if you have read any Plato with us, all of the times when Socrates is arguing with the sophists about language and its uses, this is not a new problem. Same old, same old. Yep. Got to watch out. Words are like weapons. Who are you going to point them at? What are you trying to do with them? It's a big deal. There is another online great books podcast. Enrollment may be open right now. If it is, or even if it ain't, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast, and you can join us there. If you do that, just by going to that link, you don't even have to use a discount code. You're going to get 25% off your first three months with us. And if you've enjoyed listening to us do this, know that your seminar is going to be a couple of hours a, a month of you and your bros, your OGB bros. Even the ladies are our OGB bros. Speaking about the books that we read in our program in this same kind of way. Um, Carl may be your seminar host. It might be somebody like our friend John Pascarella or Malachi that we've had on here. Who knows? Uh, but we'll help you guys uh, hash through these things. Probably do a better job than you and I do on here. This is more of a breeze shooting session, isn't it? What is this that we do? It's breeze shooting. It, well, I don't know. I hope they surpass us. It's like uh, I say to my kids, I hope you get smarter than me, but you're not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is infotainment, right? This is infotainment that we do, perhaps. And the seminar is a little headier than that. It does a better. Well, I think people do a better job of sticking to the text and uh, talking about the big ideas in there than maybe we do. But... Uh, join us up there, onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast. And when you do that, you help us know that the show is working and that it's worth us continuing to do. Meanwhile, thank you for everybody that does listen. And I think this will be the first show of the 2020 year. So I hope you guys have a merry and fruitful 2020 year as we uh, attempt to turn back the endarkening. <laughs> yes. The end. The end.